went home from the hospital with their first child, very excited, very nervous, and of course one of the first jobs is changing the diaper. And so the wife says to her young husband, honey, will you take care of this one? And he says, oh no dear, I'm busy, I'll take care of the next one. And so the next diaper arrives and needs to be changed, so she turns to her husband and he says, oh, honey, you must have misunderstood. I didn't mean the next diaper, I mean the next child. <laughs> I don't know if my father changed my diapers, but I do know he taught me. And my father taught me many things as a little boy, I remember kneeling down, learning my prayers with my father. Mother was not a Catholic at that time. I remember father teaching us right from wrong, correcting us. Of course, he taught us pitch and catch, how to ride a bike, how to fish. But most importantly, he taught us the virtues. I never heard my father say a bad word in front of us children or to my mother. In fact, if we came up with something like a bad word, I remember he would have us write 100 times, I shall not disrespect my mother. Or I shall not say a bad word in front of my mother. It was amazing. You know, you learn a number of things when you do this. The Christian Brothers School that he attended and I did as well, you learn writing to 100. You learn penmanship because it has to be clear when it's examined. You learn spelling and it, it leaves a mark in your mind. I've heard modern uh, theorists of education consider that abusive. Can you imagine? It's not abusive in the least. It makes you stop and think. Our father would teach us things like you will not dishonor our family name by telling a lie or cheating. Many, many, many examples of the importance of what a father leaves for his children in the mind and in action. I remember every Sunday he would take us to Mass and one of the most powerful realities was kneeling down next to my father in prayer and correcting my sister if she started talking with her friend. I remember that. <laughs> and my last memory with my father was at his side praying a rosary with him before he died. And he had a great devotion to our Blessed Mother. All of those realities leave a lifelong mark in a person's soul. Why? Because all of these are seeds that are planted, just like in the Gospel today. Jesus, when he talks about the Kingdom of God, the Kingdom of Heaven on Earth, is planted in our souls like a seed at our baptism. Right? And many of you planted seeds in the garden, some of which have grown, some of which have not, but it takes a lot of care, doesn't it? You've got to do the weeding and the pruning and so on and so forth. It takes much attention, water, the living water of God's love for the seed in the soul, the sunshine of truth, right, in the mind of a believer. St. Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight, just like you believe that that seed's going to grow, right? You don't see it the next day, but you believe it's coming. Makes me think about the Chinese bamboo tree. I don't know if you know this, but for the Chinese bamboo tree, the seed is planted and remains dormant in the earth for five years, not five months, not till next year. You wait five years, and then once the seedling comes up at the end of the fifth year, it grows to 90 feet tall sometimes in a matter of six weeks. Six weeks, 
90 feet tall. How does it do that? During the five years, you know what's going on? This intricate network of roots is interconnecting, interconnecting, interconnecting over five years. And once that's complete, then it has the strength to grow and grow powerfully tall. How interconnected are we with Christ, who is the source of our virtues? You know, uh, we teach uh, our children in baseball, you know, you're practicing pitch and catch over and over and over again, batting over and over and over again. What about virtues? Parents, you have to correct children. If we don't teach them to exercise virtues, what are we going to get? The vices, and plenty of them, right? We're going to grow monsters instead of men and women, right? Instead of adults. So you have to exercise the virtues through correction and through modeling and practice. For example, the, the madness of modern day road rage. Where do people get the idea that they have the right to go wild. I remember my father would say, we don't get mad. That's reserved for Englishmen. That was some old American thing. <laughs> An old American thing against the English. Self-control. Can you control yourself? That's virtue, right? Self-control. So instead of blowing up, how about praying Jesus mercy? Jesus mercy. And repeating that until your soul is calmed, right? Praying for his mercy to flow down from the cross into your soul and into the other person. Because you know what? You did some bad driving sometimes too, didn't you? So have I. We've all made mistakes. But this madness, you know, of people and then pulling out guns and shooting one another. It's gone mad. You remember uh, on Pentecost, I preached about go holy or go crazy. And our world's primarily gone crazy, hasn't it? Right? But we Christians seek holiness. Going holy. Going godly. Going for the virtues. That is where we need to strive. It was a great uh, editor many, many years of Guideposts. Some of you, I believe, have gotten that wonderful little small magazine with little spiritual thoughts for the day. Leonard uh, Lasord was the editor who died in 1996. And he wrote about his own faith growth process and compared it to the seed of the gospel today. He said that when he was a little boy, the seed that was planted about Christ for him was rather fanciful. It was a fanciful Christ, you know, hearing about the miracles and all the wonders, and it was a little dreamy for him as a kid, maybe like a fantasy. But then years later, he went to a Christian college, I believe, and it was there that he had courses on scripture, and he began to grow that now a, a sprout uh, from this seed was coming forward, a little green stem, and he called that getting to know the historical Christ, right? Who was Jesus in comparison to Aristotle, let's say, or um, Lao Tzu, or any of the great leaders of history. He was studying the historical Christ. And then some years later, as he actually began to read the Gospels for himself, he said that that stem grew and had a bud that he referred to as the teacher Christ. Christ now beginning to teach his soul about the values of the word of God and the kingdom of heaven. And then some years later with a crisis in his family, he turned to Jesus with all his mind, heart, soul, and strength, and he encountered the Savior Christ. He's moving from Jesus as an historical figure to an actual savior who's teaching his soul about redemption. 
And then finally, years growing in his faith, this seed and bud flowered in his fifth and final encounter with Christ that he called the indwelling Christ. That's the real flowering of the Christian discipleship, being a true disciple of Jesus. Christ then dwells in the soul. Do you remember that Jesus said, the kingdom of God is already within you? Because it was planted by the seed at your baptism. So the kingdom is there, but it needs to breathe. And that breath is the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in order to let Christ dwell within us. <clears throat> Pope Benedict XVI, writing about this matter, put it this way. The temptation of impatience, the temptation of immediately finding great success and finding large numbers, this is not God's way. The new evangelization cannot mean immediately attracting large masses that have distanced themselves from the church by using new and more refined methods. The new evangelization must surrender to the mystery of the grain of mustard seed and not be so pretentious as to believe it immediately produces a large tree. The Pope's point being, it's a process of growth. It's a process of discipleship. And it begins in every single home. Every single home. That's where the discipling has to begin. From Christian parents, Christian modeling, fathers and mothers, to their little ones. The head of uh, St. Paul's Outreach, in fact one of our parishioners is a member of it, a great outreach that is on campuses around the country, uh, Gordon Damaris wrote about this making disciples. He said, We do all we can to reach as many as we can, but we need to make sure that we're bearing fruit that will last, as Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16. If our evaluation of the current situation is correct, namely that we have lost the Christian foundation of our culture, then our undertaking is indeed daunting. And I think he's quite right. We've lost that foundation, that network of interconnectedness of fellow Christians. We have to recapture it. He said, what was formerly faith formation is now called new evangelization or missionary discipleship programs. But most importantly, it is the process of discipling, making true followers of Christ through exercise. Just as important as your physical exercise is your spiritual exercise. Praying in the family. Praying personally. Having an encounter with Christ. And growing in his grace. So that our seed of faith will grow and bud and flower. I conclude today with a prayer to the Holy Spirit seeking the Holy Spirit to be the master of the soul. Because that indwelling, in order for it to flourish, needing that living water of love, that light of Christ, and the truth that is eternal, comes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit, come to us, Become our interior master. Prompt us in everything. Remind us of all that Jesus said. Guide us and take direction of our whole being. Help us in our weakness. Provide for our insufficiency. Teach us to appreciate every least inspiration that is yours. Help us to avoid every slightest infidelity every little hesitation, and to refuse you nothing. Teach us that we must recover ourselves quickly and put ourselves at once under your influence with acts of love, without letting ourselves be troubled or discouraged, since your spirit is true and sweet and blessed.
both now and forever. Amen.